Colossians 1, verses 24 through 29. To state the philosophy that Paul expresses here, to many people is shocking. Um, even to the Christian, it can be a little shocking. Because, you know, we read these things and in all piety we say, yeah, you know, ready to die for Jesus, for me to live as Christ and die as gain. But you, there have been people who literally experienced that. And w from what I believe the Bible teaches, there'll come a time again where people will do that again. And, and it's my responsibility as a pastor to both teach the Bible and if my eschatology is correct, study of the last times, it may very well be that some of us enter into some degree of rejection by the world for our message. And so messages like this can become more practically applicable than maybe they were in some years past. That's up to God to work out, it's up to us to speak, right? So in stating this philosophy, it can be shocking both to the non-Christian as well as to the Christian. For example, I was talking with somebody um, not too long ago and has a particular disease and, and, and it's going to get them. And I don't mean to be callous, but, and I'm not there, so maybe I'm just wrong, but I found this person to be kind of emblematic of so many other people that they just really have this fear of dying. And maybe I'm being pious, and, and if I am, please forgive me, but I, I really think the Bible teaches us to have joy in the face of death. I really believe that, and I know I'm not there yet. But I want to think that way, I want to think biblically, so that if I get to that point, I'm prepared. Does that make sense? You know, go ahead and wet your sword now before you need it. Right? As, as witnesses for Christ, this is really germane to, to our life. Paul knew this, and, and he shares this with the Colossian people, and I really believe we can learn from it. So note, firstly, four things. Firstly, Paul's ministry in verses 24 in the first half Verse 25, Paul says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church, of which I became a minister according to the stewardship of God. So Paul's ministry, he says here, was directed toward people human beings. And he kind of lists for us three classifications. He says, first of all, for you. And that's to really the individual. Now, let's see if I can illustrate this. Think from my perspective this morning, the pastor. Is he speaking to Howard Lilly or is he speaking to the church at, that comes to Hunter's Creek? Or is he talking to the universal body? Yes. He's, he's really speaking to all of them. But from my perspective, I want this for Lynn Brown and Howard Lilly and Darren Joyner and all of you personally, individually. I, I endeavor to speak to you. But... You individually make up a part of a body, this local body, this local assembly. So as I hope, and the preacher hopes to speak to the individual, he knows that the individual is part of, and therefore the message is to, the same unit, corporately. So I want the whole body to get what I want for Darren Joyner. Does that make sense? Okay. But 
I also know not only do we have this, but this same text has been taught for 2,000 years and somebody somewhere is preaching it even now probably or soon. And, and what's in that text is meant for them too. That church at First Baptist Altoona, Pennsylvania or whatever. So it's a universal message. This is the message for the church of God. Everywhere. It's the same. It's not different for us than it is for someone somewhere else. What Paul did for these Colossians, people have for 2,000 years benefited from with encouragement, challenge, whatever the case might be. But secondly, his ministry was of God. This isn't Paul's desire being played out, you know, planned on his own. This is something that, that God has given the Apostle Paul, in this case, for the people of God, and, and, and it translates down onto the rest of us throughout the Christian history. So Paul wants this ministry, he wants these people to know that this ministry was given of God. This is God's call on him. When we think about the calling to the ministry, we have what most people refer to as an internal and external call. So Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy 3, if any man desires the office of a bishop, generally speaking, most people accept that to mean that God is moving within that individual to have that desire. An external call is where the people around him confirm that, yes, God is calling Mike Smith into the ministry and he meets the qualifications and that kind of thing. Okay, internal, external. Paul was apparently a recipient of that as we even go back as far as the uh, Damascus Road experience. So this is God's call, not somebody else's. But in that call, Paul says something. And, and he's told us this before. He suffers. I'm reading a book, by, um, it's a biography about a guy named Charles Simeon. And when Charles Simeon went to Cambridge University, a lot of the preacher boys, for lack of a better word, went there to, to get religion and so that they could take some kind of parish church or somewhere in England, you know. But, but theology really wasn't a big deal. They weren't really interested in biblical truth and getting it right, understanding the Bible, proclaiming it at all costs. Whatever It's a matter of going through the steps, and this is in the late 1700s, and you know, you kind of get your, your bearings, you get your degree, and then you go take a church somewhere, and you really have a nice living at some parish church, okay? It's a pretty good deal. But Simeon wasn't satisfied with that. God was moving in his heart kind of like a Martin Luther, just really pressing upon him for truth and rightness. And so Charles Simeon took it seriously. He took theology seriously. But the problem was, when Simeon did that, he, he was eventually given a church right there kind of on campus. And, and, and the people couldn't stand him. He went out and he preached the Bible. And he would, he would walk along campus and people would throw fruit at him. This is literal. He would have, in the church... The, the, the people who managers, they thought of them as they, they would lock the pews. So he rented chairs and he put the chairs in the, in, in the hallways for people to sit. But the managers, they would throw the chairs out. They didn't let him preach at night, you know, in the evening service. He, he was ridiculed and he was persecuted by people within the church. Now, you, you would think that Charles Simeon would just bolt. Right? He didn't. He took the slow, methodical path. He ended up being a, a great, great man, sent many missionaries into the field. Now they have preaching conferences all around the world in Charles Simeon's name. But, but early on, he really was persecuted by the world and even by the local church 
for doing that. You would not think that people in the ministry would suffer such things. You would think people would love and care for them, and oftentimes they do. But Paul knew what it was like to suffer both within and without. The more I love, the less I be loved, he would say. Paul really knew what it was like to suffer loss. In fact, you know Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. Paul said, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. And here, look back up at verse 24, what Paul says about his ministry. I rejoice in my sufferings. Paul count it, counted it a, a, a pleasure, a, a privilege to suffer for Christ. He lost his reputation. He lost his wealth. He endured much physical pain the care for all the churches, the anguish mentally, emotionally, physically, for ministry. But he says something here. He, he says something here that is very important. Look back up at verse 24, because he says, in the middle of that verse, he says, I am filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Now, to the English reader, we read that, and, we, and, and it sounds like Paul's having to do what Jesus left undone. That, that's not the idea. That, that's not what's being said at all. Jesus did not leave anything undone. Jesus accomplished all of his earthly ministry while he was in the flesh. There are 28 books or chapters in the book of Acts. There's a ministry out there in the world called Acts 29. Now, Acts 29 Ministries is not an attempt to write a 29th chapter. What they're saying is we are carrying on where the apostles left off, the 29th chapter. So, like, if you look at the beginning of the book of Acts, in its title, it's the Acts of the Apostles. So what you have is you have a conclusion of the Lord's earthly ministry. Then you have the beginning of the apostles' earthly ministry. But eventually they all died. But the church must go on. The message must go on. So now you've exited verse, uh, chapter 28 and you've entered into, if you will, a chapter 29. If I could put it that way, which is what that ministry seeks to do. That's kind of what Paul is saying here. Jesus has finished what he was doing. It's incumbent upon me to continue on in that ministry that Jesus has gone from. And that is what we do. Jesus paid, faced rejection. The apostles faced rejection. And we will face rejection. We continue to fill up what the apostles, if we can put it in our terms now, were lacking. Does that make sense? We're continuing. We are carrying the mantle forward from them. And our young people will carry it on from us and so forth. That's what Paul is referring to. But this is costly. But you know, there are some things worth suffering for. Now, this is hard for us Westerners because we, our goal is to live a life of ease. We, we, you know, we want to work hard, retire early, and, 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 and you know, live in the lap of luxury until we draw our last breath. That's kind of the Western way, right? That's not the biblical way. That's not most of the rest of the world's way. But we have that mentality, and I'm afraid we've kind of bought into it. So there are things worth suffering for. Number one, I just want to go sideways here, is truth is worth suffering for. If it's right, it's a hill to die on. Especially, and I'm thinking ecclesiastical, theological, okay? If the Bible says it, it's something we should stand on. Imagine, if you will, what would happen if, say, in the 1400s, 
Somebody gave in to the pressure from the world on a theological issue that was essential to salvation. And everybody said, well, you know, it's just really not worth fighting for. So, you know, if, if we can just incorporate some works into it, everybody's okay with that. Well, then, for hundreds of years, people would have been believing the wrong thing and salvation would have been corrupted. It is essential that we both proclaim and stand for truth. All truth. As my friend in Ghana, West Africa says, all truth is God's truth. And it is worth standing on. And it is worth standing for. These are convictions. Amen? Amen. Truth is worth, stand, uh, it worth dying for, punish, being punished for, and, and people are worth dying for and worth living for. Here's how the Apostle Paul put it in Romans chapter 5. He said, For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would even dare to die. So if you had to take a place for someone else, who would you take the place for? Let's use easy terms, Barabbas or Jesus. If you had to pick who, which one you were going to die in the stead of, you'd say, well, Jesus is worth dying for. Barabbas is a murderer. But now let's back up. Who would Jesus have died for? There's your answer. People are worth dying for. That's why, this is why soldiers go to battle. having loved their own more than life itself. So Paul's ministry was to share something that is truly worth paying a high price for. And this thing he says in verses 25 through 27 is a mystery. Well, it, it, at some point it had been a mystery. Let's read those verses. 25, he says, Of which I became a minister from God, it was given to me, to make the word of God fully known. That word of God is the mystery hidden from ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints, comma, excuse me, period, to them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is, here's the mystery, Christ in you, the hope of glory. So Paul says this thing is something, a mystery that has been hidden. Now, sometimes a history, a mystery that is hidden is kind of in, really in full sight. And to some degree it was because all throughout the Old Testament, we hear hints and little pieces of Gentile people coming into, but through circumcision, into Judaism. Okay, You could be a convert into it. So it's not that it never happened. It's just that the Gentiles didn't have the covenants and the promises and the fathers that the Jewish people did. But there were hints every now and then that God was going to do a great thing. Ladies and gentlemen, every, as far as I know, everyone in here is a Gentile. And if you are a Gentile, you are a recipient of exactly what Paul is talking about here. You have no promise through Judaism. You don't keep the covenants. You don't keep the Sabbath. You don't do any of those religious works. You're a Gentile person who's come to God through Jesus Christ. You are these people. Aren't you glad? This is wonderful, and I experience it. I, and you are experiencing it right now. We're living it. Paul says there were periods of time, ages, that didn't have this full revelation of this mystery like we have today. 
And inside those ages, there were generations, there were groups of people that those individuals did not have it because it was not as um, available, broadcast, as it is for us today. Now, isn't this a message worth sharing? Unhiding? Certainly it is. Paul recognizes that. The New Testament emphasizes the covenant in Christ to largely Gentiles. There are Jews in there just as there were Gentiles in the Old Testament, peppered in here and there. And Paul says this is the word of God. Specifically, Christ in you. And I just want you to think about that phrase for a second. Christ in in you. Now, you wonder, well, what does that mean? Is that metaphorical? What does it mean, in? It means in, like enveloped by. You say, well, you know, that, that can't be. It's, it's just not possible for Christ to be in me. Oh, it's very possible. In fact, the Bible says that we are the spirit of the indwelling God, right? Right? The Holy Spirit we are baptized into and he indwells us. And we know we'll always be in this life on this earth. In means in. Now I want to step back for a second because we've been talking about just in the previous section of this chapter. The incarnation of Christ. Jesus being God in the flesh. So now it, it's kind of easy for us to think, okay, you know, Christ preexistent, he always was somehow, some way, some embodiment. I don't know, you know, some kind of theophany we see in the Old Testament, you know, um, a warrior kind of thing. But then it gets difficult because Jesus is a baby. <laughs> Jesus comes to earth as a little man, a little boy. Now, I can't understand that because you got to think about something now. This little boy, this little baby, this infant created everything. He is, he is infinite. He is eternal. He is beyond measure. Big, size, wise. But he becomes a little eight pound, six ounce baby who does baby things. And somehow that one is the creator. That's what we celebrate every year on December 25th. That's what Paul has been talking about. So this great creator God becomes a little boy. He dies and he's resurrected after living a perfect life. All of a sudden, it's not so crazy to think that he is in me, is it? Because he is in me. That's what makes you different. That's why you think the way you think and very often why you do what you do, why you believe what you believe and why you're willing to pay the price for that message just as Paul was. So this is deep stuff and still oriented towards the incarnation. But it's not just a miraculous, theological, cool thing to think about. There's a practical application to this because Paul says this Christ in you is something. It is the hope of glory. Because in being in Christ, I have a hope for eternity. A big deal, a big thing. We think of the doxology, you know, we sing the doxology. Well, that's what this word glory is. It's doxa. Christ in you, the hope of all that is big and great and hopeful. Life. Christ dwells in you. Now you think, okay, that's still kind of weird. Well, 
Jesus said it with his own words. You don't have to turn there, but you can. John chapter 17. John chapter 17 is one big prayer by Jesus before he goes to Gethsemane to the Father. And in verse 21, he said, he's praying to the Father, said, that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. Now, we're not going to take any qualms at believing that Jesus and the Father are one and the same, right? But he just said, they may be one like we are one. He finishes out. That they also may be in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. Then he says in verse 23, I in them and you in me. That they may become perfectly one so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. I, I mean, it's nice to see those words. I believed it. You know, when Paul said it, I certainly believe it when Jesus says it because I'd give more credit there. But, but that doesn't mean I understand it any better. It's not a matter of understanding. By faith, it's a matter of accepting what you don't understand. And that's really one of the hurdles to salvation, but it's a crux of salvation. That's why salvation is a gift of God through faith. This is why we have hope for an eternity with God which very few people truly know. Hope to the hopeless is a message that is worth giving. More than likely, you've never truly been hopeless. Or if you have, it's, it's a rare thing for you to be hopeless. But if you've ever been in a hopeless, helpless situation, it's very discouraging, it's depressing, it's disappointing, it's, it's hopeless, without hope. But Christ in you is hope, the hope of glory. And thirdly says, we do this with certain message, methods. Paul says in chapter 1, verse 28, and I love this text. He says, him we proclaim warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Paul's methods were several. He says, gives some of them to us. He says, number one, we proclaim. This is the concept of to preach or to herald, to evangelize with the gospel. We, we, we speak this message. We tell people of this truth. We want them to know there's hope and that hope is only in Christ. As joyous as it is for us, it should be compelling to us to give to others so that they too might have that hope and the joy that we have. And to really not give it to them is a little bit more than just being selfish. There's really an aspect disobedience there, but, but I'll leave that alone for now. Paul, the, in, in Acts chapter 13, verses 38 and 39 says, Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and by him everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. What, what a wonderful message that is. It's our message. Paul understands it. But then he says, secondly, we don't just preach Christ. There's another element of our ministry. He says, we, we admonish people. There's a, a kind of counseling called neuthetic counseling. It comes from the Greek word for neuthetic. And, and it, it carries the idea of admonishing. It, it's not, hey, please don't do that anymore. It says, you, sh you better not do that anymore. You should not do that because you're admonishing the person. You're not just pleading with them happily. You're telling them there's a problem with what they're doing. There could be punishment for what they're doing. Bridge out. That's an admonition. So Paul is doing that with these people. Why would he do that? Because left to our own, we all have a tendency to kind of change the, the theology, right? 
to do our own thing, kind of like Cain did with bringing the kind of offering he wanted to in Genesis chapter 3. We're all that way. There's Cain in all of us. So Paul has to admonish people on a variety of different things. In 1 Thessalonians 5.14, here's how the Apostle Paul put it. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. There, did, did anybody notice the slight admonition that I gave you this morning? I was giving you a very gracious, subtle one this morning when I said, it's a new year, get engaged. Sign up for something, get involved in something, exercise your Christian life. I'm not teaching you the gospel, I'm trying to encourage you to live out the gospel. That was a slight admonition in case you missed it. And thirdly, Paul says, we educate people, we, we teach people. That's one of the reasons why we try to exercise expositional preaching. So Paul says to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 4, that is why, verse 17, I sent you Timothy, or I sent Timothy to you, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. The good faithful pastor wants to educate his people, to inform them. Admonish when it's needed, teach where it's needed. And he says, this is comprehensive. This is something everybody gets. It's not like, you know, okay, if you've got a, a bachelor's in theology, you're exempt from it. Everybody, even the preacher, needs to be reminded of these things, to be taught these things. We do this to everybody, everywhere. Nobody is exempt, and we do it with an, an element of wisdom. And the, the wisdom here is like reading the book of Proverbs. It's experiential wisdom. I know what I'm talking about because I've done it before. I've gone through this. Paul knows what he's talking about, right? Wouldn't you say? He went through it. It has an objective, and the objective is the presentation of mature Believers, it's we get the word teleological. It's the end, uh, teleos. It, so it's like here's the end of where you're supposed to be, mature, ripened, all the way. There's nothing more to be added. Another day and you're spoiled, if you will. Okay. So Paul wants everyone to know this. It's comprehensive. It's helpful. It has an objective. In 1 Thessalonians 2, verses 19 and 20, Paul said, For what is our hope? And, and this goes back to the pastoral element. I'm trying to be a little personal with you right now, but this is how Paul put it, and I, I would say the same. I feel the same. He says, For what is our hope or joy or crown of boasting? Before our Lord Jesus at his coming, is it not you? It's a rhetorical question. Are you not my crown of rejoicing when the Lord comes? Can I give you a little pastoral insight? It is. I may not be great like Paul. Certainly nobody's great like Jesus. But, but, but God moves in a pastor's heart. That's why he's oftentimes very passionate. That's why he doesn't have a, a problem admonishing when it's needed. That's why he enjoys being with the flock. Because he's wanting to do something. He's wanting the people to be something. And he's wanting them to be whatever he wants to be himself. Mature. To the end. For you are our glory and our joy. I fantasize about this sometimes. I think about heaven... And, and there's a couple things I really fear. I fear every sermon because they're never that good. I fear getting things wrong. I fear accountability for every book I have, every class I've ever had. But I fantasize about one day getting into eternity and seeing you and hoping that the Lord has used me to do something for you 
and you to do something for me. I'm just being honest with you. That's not meant to be pious. That's completely transparent and it's honest. Every good pastor wants that. It's part of pastoring. It's in the name, pastor. And then lastly, Paul's muscle. What's the strength behind what he does? In verse 29, Paul says, For this I, I toil, I struggle with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. He knows that he might, his tongue might be the muscle speaking the word, but it's Christ who, who's got to work it out in his heart so that it comes out of his mouth. He, he labors, every pastor will tell you, he labors through the week in his sermon preparation and he, he's putting things together and he's trying to be careful and, and he's, doing, he's doing his best to put together a message that is right biblically and good for the people and glorifying to God. So he does his part, but he also will be the very first one to tell you that it is Christ who's working in him to do all that stuff. And that's the way it should be. That's what Paul's telling us it was with him. It's like when you prepare a Sunday school class or whatever the case might be. Paul's working is not in his own strength, but it's in Christ's. But Paul knows practically you feel the effect of it. He says, I toil. And that carries the idea of fatigue. It, it, you get tired. You, you, every pastor will tell you when he's sitting down, you know, he, he's thinking and writing and it's, it's wearisome. This isn't something you just go on sermon... I don't know, sermonoutline.com or something, and, you know, pull out a good outline, and, hey, you know, this is, it's exhausting. It hurts. How much more for this guy who's walking from place to place in his sandals and behind camels and who knows whatever else, it, it takes its toll. But ladies and gentlemen, Paul says, I rejoice. Go back up to verse 24. I rejoice in this. What are you, some kind of freak? You like pain? No. No, Paul knows the value of the message. He knows the good for the hearer. He knows the truth of the theology and the glory to God. And, and you know what? That is worth paying a price for. The heaviest of prices. This is why people go to the stockade. This is why they go to the firing line. This is why they go to the prisons. This was why they go to the fags of, of, of logs and burning. This is why they do it because of Christ in you, the hope of glory is a mystery that Paul wants the riches of it to be known to everyone. So him we proclaim. Him we herald. Paul spent his life in this. He said to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 12, I will most gladly spend and be spent for your souls. If I love you more, am I to be loved less? Paul's, it's a rhetorical question again, but, but he's in that first part of the rhetorical question is, I love you. I love you. Shepherds love sheep. They care for them. So we noted earlier that humans have a tendency for self-preservation, and, and that's not all bad. But when our self-preservation betrays our allegiance, our commission to this message, then literally we have decided that my health is more important than this great mystery. 
That's what we've decided. And I think we would all, especially after looking at this text, disagree with this. So this isn't meant to be a silly statement, but intentional. Are you, are you ready to die? Are you, are you ready to die? Now, you could have an aneurysm in, before I count to three, one, two, three. You could have a heart attack. You could get killed going home. The world may turn upside down and everybody hates Christians. Persecution, tribulation. Who knows? But when you die, if you were to die in four seconds, would you be ready? Would you be ready on a couple levels? Would you be ready because you're satisfied that you're laboring for Christ? And though we'll all be a little ashamed at least, you know, you can say, I, I, I labored for you, Lord. Or, to the other extreme, are you even in Christ? Because if you're not in Christ and you don't have this hope of glory, trust me, you are not ready to die. But you're going to die. We're all going to die. And when you die, if you're not ready to meet Christ face to face, his condemnation is already on you. John 3, 18. And it will remain on you if you die in that state for eternity because after death, there's no more chances. After this death is the judgment. Are you ready to die? I hope that you are. If you're not, we're going to have a responsive song here in a moment. I just want to encourage you to think about life and death. And If you're a converted person, I want you to think about your willingness to proclaim Christ in you, the hope of glory, to live it, to share it.